Good morning to everybody. It is good to see everyone here this morning. We appreciate you coming to support our gospel meeting. We've already had one excellent lesson today. Got a couple of letdowns, but then maybe tomorrow night they'll pick up again. So we'll see what we can get through here today. You know, many in the religious world believe that the church was an emergency stopgap plan B. Because God sent His Son into this world to set up an earthly kingdom, and the Jews rejected Him and Jesus failed. That is what is taught in most of the religious world today. But as we look in our lesson this morning, we're going to see that the church was purposed by God before time began. It was promised before time began. It was prophesied throughout history. It was prepared for by the forerunner of Jesus, that being John the baptizer, and then it was perfected in Christ. So we're going to look today at the church, God's eternal purpose, not His plan B. We're going to look first of all at God's purpose. God had everything planned for the church before the world even began. His master plan we see in the Word of God. God chose us to be blessed before the foundation of the world. Ephesians 1, verses 4 and 5 says, According as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Notice when that was. Before the foundation of the world. Verse 5, He says, Having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will. Now, when we look at that word predestinated, Thayer says it means to predetermine or decide beforehand. Well, what did God predetermine or decide beforehand? He predetermined or predestinated a plan and that those who obey that plan would be saved. God determined that. Before the world began, the salvation of mankind was the purpose and plan of God. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 and 10 says, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus, notice when, before the world began. Verse 10, but now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. All right, and God calls us by the gospel. 2 Thessalonians 2.14 Whereunto He called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how God calls us today. He doesn't call us, as Michael set forth in his lesson, through visions or dreams or whispers or anything like that. God calls us by His Word through the Gospel. Before the foundation of the world, God's purpose was man's redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18-20 through 20 says, For as much as ye know that we were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold, from our vain conversation, that being lifestyle, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish, without spot, who verily was, notice, foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest or made known in these last times for you. So we'll notice that Christ bought us back. That means that He redeemed us. Christ's blood was precious, is something of rare and great value. Christ's blood was foreordained, or Christ was. In other words, the knowledge beforehand was known. And Christ was made manifest or made known at this time. Before the world began, God promised eternal life to mankind. Titus chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul, a servant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Notice that God's eternal plan was the salvation of mankind, not a physical kingdom set up on this earth. 
It was mankind's redemption. Before the world was created, God knew that His creation would slay the Christ. Acts chapter 2, verses 22 to 24 says, Ye men of Israel, Peter speaking, hear these words of Jesus of Nazareth, or hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, the man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Did God know beforehand that Christ was going to be killed? Yes, he did. The church was not a plan B. That's God's plan all along that the church would be established. But anyway, he continues to say, Ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. In other words, God wasn't caught by surprise when the Messiah was killed. God knew that that was going to happen. God's plan was in action all the way along. That's time. Now let's look at God's promise. His promise is shown to us throughout history. We're going to look at some of these briefly because of time. In Genesis 1-1, the world was created. In Genesis chapter 3, sin entered into the world when Adam and Eve partook of the forbidden fruit there. In Genesis 3.15, while Adam and Eve still had the fig leaves on, God there promised a Redeemer, a spiritual seed, a seed of woman that would bruise the head of the serpent, or crush the head of the serpent, and he would crush the, the seed's heel. In Genesis chapter 12 that Michael read this morning, also verse 7 and chapter 22, verse 18 of Genesis. There are three promises given to Abraham. The first promise is that he would become a great nation, or that is the nation promise. The second promise that is made is he would be given a land, a land promise. The third promise that was made was through him all the nations of the earth would be blessed. That's the spiritual seed promise. So these three promises were given to Abraham. In Genesis, and this is about 1921 B.C., and you'll see where we get that number in a little while. In Genesis 23, or chapter 26, verses 3 and 4, those promises are repeated to Isaac. In Genesis 35, 10 to 12, those promises are repeated to Jacob. In Genesis 37 through 50, we see there the story of Joseph. Now why are we going through all this? It's because God's plan is in action for the church to come in existence through history. In chapter 50 of Genesis, verses 24 and 25, there Joseph repeats the land promise to the nation of Israel. Those verses read, in other words, the nation promise has been fulfilled now. They are a nation while they are in Egypt. Those verses read, Genesis 50, 20-24, And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die, and God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land unto the land which he sware, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones from hence. So Israel was now a nation. The nation promise has been fulfilled. Then we come to Exodus chapter 1. Through chapter 14, we see Moses. We see his birth. We see his flight into Midian. We see his bleeding of the deliverance of Israel across the Red Sea. And then in Exodus chapter 20, the law was given about 1491 B.C. You know, we usually estimate about 1500 B.C. is whenever the law was given. Well, where do we come up with these time periods? In Galatians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, It says there were 430 years from the promise that was given to Abraham to the time of the giving of the law. In other words, from Genesis chapter 12 through Exodus chapter 20 was 430 years. Galatians 3, 16 and 17 read, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not and the seeds as of many, but as of one and to thy seed which is Christ. 
And this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, that's the promises, the law which was 430 years after cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. So there are 430 years there between the promise to Abraham in Genesis 12 and the giving of the law there in Exodus chapter 20. Then we come through Exodus and Deuteronomy, the wilderness wanderings, the 40 years that the children of Israel were there. And during that time, we still see God's plan in action. We see God's prophecy of the Messiah. In Deuteronomy 18.15, it says, The Lord thy God, this is Moses speaking, will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee of thy brethren like unto me, unto him shall ye hearken. And then God said in Genesis, excuse me, Deuteronomy 18, 18, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Who is the prophet that he's speaking of? In John chapter 5, verses 45 through 47, Jesus said, Do not think that I accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. For had ye believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? So we see God's plan, for the church is still in action. Then we come to Joshua. Here we have the land promise fulfilled. In Joshua chapter 21, verses 43 to 45, it says, And the Lord gave unto Israel all the land which He sware unto their fathers. And they possessed it and dwelt therein, and the Lord gave them rest round about, according to all that He sware unto their fathers. And there stood not a man of their enemies before them. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. There failed not aught of any good thing which the Lord had spoken unto the house of Israel. All came to pass. So the end, the nation promise was fulfilled earlier. Now the land promise is fulfilled, but the spiritual seed promise has not yet been fulfilled at that time. Then we come to the United Kingdom. 1 Samuel chapter 8 through 11. You know, you remember the kings of the United Kingdom. Saul, David, and Solomon. During that time, the spiritual seed promise is given to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 13. It says, And when thy days shall be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name. And I will establish the throne of His kingdom forever. That house that would be established is the church. That kingdom that would be established is the church. God's plan is still in action. In Acts chapter 2, verses 29 and 30, we see reference back to what we just read. Peter there says, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. That's how we know he's speaking of Christ back there in 2 Samuel 7. Then we come to another time stamp there during this united kingdom. That's 1 Kings 6 1. There were 480 years from the giving of the law to the beginning of the temple. 1 Kings 6 1 reads, It came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month Ziph, which is the second month, that he began to build the house of the Lord. So you take, well, we'll go ahead and do this slide, that makes 910 years from the time that the promises were given to Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12 till the time that the temple was started there in 1 Kings chapter 6. And the temple was started in 1011 B.C. So we've got the 430 years from the promise to Abraham to the law 
Galatians 3.17 that we looked at. And then the 480 years from the law, from the time the children of Israel came out of Egypt, to the fourth year of Solomon. So that's where we get 910 years. Now we come to the divided kingdom. 1 Kings chapter 12. God, during that time, was still prophesying of the Messiah and of the church. In the 8th century, Isaiah prophesied from 750 to 800 B.C. Isaiah prophesied during the reigns of Isaiah, Ahaz, Hezekiah, and tradition has it, he lived until the time of Manasseh and was sown asunder under Manasseh's reign, Manasseh being Hezekiah's son. Isaiah 1.1 says, The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, in the days of Isaiah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Isaiah gives many prophecies there of the church and of the coming Messiah. The one I want to look at is Isaiah 53. That gives us a picture of the suffering Savior. It begins, Who hath believed thy report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. And as a root of a dry ground, he hath no form or comeliness. And when we shall see him, <coughs> excuse me, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Right there shows us that Christ was not a handsome man. There's no beauty that would be desired. People would desire him. Verse 3. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed Him not. Surely He hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem Him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him, and with His stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to His own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb. In other words, he didn't speak, so he opened it not his mouth. He was taken from prison in judgment. Who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. That was his crucifixion. And for why? For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he was made, or he made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Right there shows that God knew what was taking place. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, and he shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of it, or see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. Right there shows us that God looked ahead. He saw what Jesus Christ went through, and that satisfied him. He continues to say, By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. We see God's plan is still in action. Then we come to the time of Judah alone. 2 Kings 17, 21-23. This is when Assyria conquered the northern ten tribes in 721 B.C. Those verses read, For he rent Israel from the house of David, and they made Jeroboam the son of Nebat, and Jeroboam a king. And Jeroboam drave Israel from following the Lord, and made them sin a great sin. For the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did, and he departed not from them, until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, as he has said, by all his service to prophets, so was Israel carried away out of their own land to Assyria unto this day. 
is during that time that Jeremiah <coughs> excuse me, prophesied of a new covenant that God would make with Israel. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant. See, God's plan is still in action. A new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, that being the law of Moses, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inner parts, write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people, and they shall teach no more. Every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. And Hebrews chapter 8, verses 8 through 12 shows the fulfillment of that prophecy. God's plan was still in action. Then we come to the fall of Judah, 2 Chronicles 36, 15 through 20. It says, And the Lord God of their fathers sent unto them by his messengers, rising up betimes and sending, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised His words and misused His prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against His people till there was no remedy. Therefore, He brought upon them the king of the Chaldees who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion upon young man or maiden or old man or him that stooped for age. He gave them all into His hand. Verse 18, And all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king and of his princes, and all these brought into Babylon. And they burnt the house of God, and break down the wall of Jerusalem, and burn all the palaces thereof with fire, and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. And them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants unto him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. The Babylonians came upon Jerusalem in 606, in 597, and in 586 B.C. And in 586 was when Jerusalem was destroyed. But during that time of captivity, God's prophesying still continued. In Daniel 2.44 is the one we're going to look at, but in Ezekiel we see the prophesying as well. Daniel prophesied in the days of these kings, that's the fourth kingdom, that being the Roman Empire, Shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed? And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, earthly kingdoms. And it shall stand forever. That kingdom He would set up, that being the church. God's plan was still in action. During that 70 years of Babylonian captivity, prophesying was still being done of the church. Then they returned to Jerusalem in 536 B.C. by the decree of Cyrus, 2 Chronicles 36, 22 and 23. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord might be spoken by the, or spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me. And he hath charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord is God be with him and let him go up. All right, during this time, who are the godly men now? There is Zerubbabel, the governor that was sent back. Jeshua, the high priest that went back. There were the prophets Haggai and Zechariah who prophesied to encourage them to rebuild the temple. Encourage them in the things that they were doing. And the temple was completed in 516. Then we come to those men by the name of Ezra and Nehemiah. God's plan is still in action. And God's prophesying continues. In Zechariah 12.10 he says, I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Who's that talking about? That's Christ. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. 
In Zechariah 13, 1, In that day shall be a fountain open in the house of David to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanness. What's that fountain? That's Jesus' blood. The church would be established. God's plan was still in action. During that time period, the Old Testament time period, there were over 300 prophecies about Christ the Messiah coming. All those were fulfilled in Christ. You might remember this number. That is 1 over 1 times 10 to the 23rd of 1% of a possibility of one person fulfilling all those prophecies. But then we come to God's preparation for the kingdom. That's John the baptizer. <clears throat> John is prophesied of in Isaiah 40, verse 3, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight the desert a highway for our God. In Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, it is prophesied there, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming and the great dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Concerning Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, the voice of Him crying in the wilderness, in John 1, 19-23, it says, this, second, this is the record excuse me, of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask Him, Who art thou? And He confessed, I am not the Christ. Or He, den he confessed and denied not, but, I, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he said, I'm not. Art thou that prophet? <clears throat> he answered, No. Then said they unto him, Who art thou, that we may give answer to them that sentest? What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as saith the prophet Isaiah. And then in Matthew chapter 11, verses 7 to 14, Jesus says that John is. The John or is the Elijah that is sent to them. It says as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with a wind? But what went ye out to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in kings' houses. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. But notice what he says now. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he, greater than John. What's the kingdom? It's the church. It's the church. Verse 12, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. What did John do? He prepared the way for the Christ. John 1, 29, The next day seeth John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. What was John's message? Matthew 3, 1 and 2. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven that was mentioned back in Genesis 3, 15 through all this time period we looked at, John says it's now here. It's ready to be here. It's at hand. God's plan still in action. Then we see God's perfection. His plan completed. Jesus came when the time was right. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. It says, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son made of a woman made under the law. The time was now right for Christ to come into the world. The seed promise was now fulfilled. Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. It says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, And to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So now every promise at that time had been fulfilled that God had given to Abraham. What was Jesus' message? Matthew 4, 17. From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
It's nearby. It's ready. It's coming. Here it is. You see it. John, uh, Jesus told how to enter the kingdom. John 3, 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. What is born of the water and the Spirit? That's baptism, is it not? According to what the Spirit has commanded. God's plan still in action. But it was being completed. Matthew 16, 18 and 19. I say unto thee also that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. There Jesus is giving synonyms, the church and the kingdom. They are the same. He says, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. What are keys? They're a means of entrance. They're an authority of entrance. If I give you the keys to my car, I give you the authority to enter my car. And if I told you to drive it, yeah, that's fine too. If I give you the keys to my house, I give you the authority to enter my house. God said, or Jesus said, I'm going to give you, Peter, and the other apostles there, the keys to the kingdom, the authority to show how to get into the kingdom. That's what Jesus did. Those keys were given on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, verses 37 through 39. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise. What promise? Promise of eternal life. The promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. God's plan was perfected right there. God's plan was completed right there. The church was established. Acts 2.41 Then they that gladly received His Word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. The them is told to us in verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people, the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. You go back and you look at all the promises that were made. You go and look at everything that God did was for the salvation of mankind. The kingdom came into existence, Colossians 1, 12 and 13. Giving thanks to God and the Father which made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. We can't be translated into the kingdom if the kingdom's not here. But the kingdom is here. Again, it's the church. God's kingdom, the church, is here today. Revelation 1.9 Look at all the ands that we see in here. All the little word ands. I, John, who am also your brother, and, I'm a brother, and a companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom, and in the patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the Word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. John was in the kingdom then. He was in the church. God's plan completed. The church is here. 1 Corinthians 15, 24-26. When is the church going to stop? Then cometh the end when He shall have delivered up the kingdom to God. Jesus is going to deliver us, the church, to God the Father. When He shall have put down all rule and authority and power, for He must reign. That means He's reigning now. Till He hath put all enemies under His feet, and the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And in the verses that Michael read for us earlier, Ephesians 3, 9-11, to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known by the church. I hear some say this is to be made known to the church. I hear some say it's to be made known by the church. I don't see any problem with it being both. God's Word makes these things known to us and we make these things known to others. 
others. But what are the others? What are we teaching? By the church, the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which He purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. The church was here, was never a plan B. That is God's master plan. God everything, everything planned from before the foundation of the world. God knew that He was going to create mankind. God knew that mankind would sin. God knew that Jesus would have to die on a cross so that we could have salvation. So what did He do? He planned the church. It is the only blood-bought institution where the saved are found. That's the only place the saved are found. And He planned the church before the universe was created. God did not fail to establish His kingdom back in A.D. 33. The kingdom or the church was in the eternal purpose of God before the world began. You know, this morning, that kingdom is here today. That kingdom is the church. You recall Jesus said to get into the church that you must be born of the water and of the Spirit. Jesus, or excuse me, Peter said that you got to repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. We understand also from other passages that we must believe what the Word of God says. Repent of our sins, confess Christ's deity, and if we're immersed in water, we're going to be added to the same church that they were added to there on the day of Pentecost back in AD 33. But if you are a child of God this morning, we also must be faithful until, the, until we die. Or even if it costs us our life, we must be faithful unto death. So this morning, if you have any need, if you need the prayers of the church, or if you want to become part of God's kingdom, you can do that today too. We invite you to come make your needs known right now as we stand and sing. <coughs>